Now, one of the really cool features of Gemini is these ideas of gems. Now, gems allow you to include like your own resources in its knowledge bank. Okay. So I've got this one here. This is called APIs, IoT, and Hardware Security. I mean, I'd, I'd be very nervous putting this out into production, like ways other hackers can get hold of it. Yeah, definitely. I think there is a real risk here that, you know, there has been evidence in like malware that people have seen when they've analyzed the malware that shows that the malware authors are actually vibe coding malware. Wow. Right? Like that is definitely a risk. And it is really easy to get AI to generate something that can be harmful. I think for me, my big worry is, you know, AI is allowing malicious actors to scale up campaigns. They don't need to know the technical knowledge. Now they can just vibe code something. And as we kind of move into this new AI dominated lens, there's still always going to be a place for, you know, folks who know, who can read the code. AI isn't going to get everything right, but it can get 90% of the way there. And 10% is not that much. Everyone, David Bobble coming to you from Black Hat with the amazing Katie. Katie, great to have you back on the show. I am so happy to be here. What an amazing time to come to Las Vegas and hang out at the Threat Locker booth. Exactly. And you've got a really cool topic that we're going to be talking about. You're a developer. Yep. Vibe coding seems to be this new big thing. Yep. I've seen you talk about it, vibe coding to hack. Perhaps you can tell us about it, like... What's, what, what's the situation with the vibe coding and hacking? And perhaps you've got to show us a demo, hopefully. Yeah, definitely. I used to be a developer back in the day before I got into security. And I still do quite a lot of development stuff. So when vibe coding became like a real thing and we started getting like the integrated IDEs with Cursor yeah. and, you know, to claw to a lesser extent, especially the platforms like V0, I was like, man, as a developer, I want to try this. It was so good. I was making applications that would have taken me weeks in literally seconds. I, I was... I was literally, I was amazed. I was entranced. I was, I was vibing. Like I loved it. I was sitting there just telling it what to add and what to add and what to add. And you know what I didn't do? Yeah. Think about security. Yeah, exactly. I have a PhD in cybersecurity, and I, I was like, we don't need security. We're just vibing. And I, that for me was this like real moment of ah, uh, because I was like. Oh, I, I know security. Yep. And even I shut my brain off because yep. I was enjoying the process of just creating so much. And so I have quite a lot of empathy for developers now when it comes to like vibe coding because it really is addictive. Like to watch something come together like that, to be able to express your creativity, incredible. Um, but yeah, even I forgot about the security aspect of it. I was just having a good time. I really want to thank Threat Locker for sponsoring my trip to Black Hat 2025 here in Vegas. It's fantastic to be here and meet so many amazing people. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, Threat Locker, for sponsoring this trip and for sponsoring this video. Just for people who don't know what vibe coding is, is that where you're just telling um, an LLM basically in words what it should create and it goes makes the code for you? Yeah, absolutely. So the way I do it, the demonstration I'm going to show, we're going to use Gemini to build like a sprint backlog. So we're going to tell Gemini, we want to create an app that does this, this, and this. It's going to turn that into a to-do list. We're going to take that to-do list and put it into Cursor. And then Cursor is going to make it all for us. So there's two parts of this, right? There's the part that you've just highlighted about vulnerabilities in the code that's being created. Yep. But the flip side of that is penetration testers, people, ethical hackers can really leverage this to create tools. Is that right? A hundred percent. Like I, for an ethical hacker, like especially if you don't know how to program, this is such a game changer for us. Like being able to create tools that meet our needs perfectly, that are exactly what we what we want, what we need, and actually just create that, like just make it. It's incredible. And I think we're going to see in the next, you know, year or so, while a lot of these tools are not production ready, right? They're not going to be something that you get, you buy or you sell. Yep. It's going to be something that you make and you use in your pen test and it supports the way you hack. And so you can do some really, really cool stuff with just creating your own things like hack bots where you create AI agents that can hack, find vulnerabilities for you, whether that's creating scanning tools yep. that can take a payload list and test that for you. The rate that we can now create tools that are perfectly suited to the tasks that we need them to perform is crazy. Like It's going to change the game so much. I can see you're so excited about it, and I want to talk more, but perhaps you could just show us the demo, because I know a lot of people want to see you know, how it actually works, because talk is nice, but 
seeing it is, is better. hundred percent. Yeah. Let's jump onto the laptop. So whenever you do any vibe coding, you need a ton of documentation. Yep. Uh, in fact, like the more you can express in natural language, the better. Now, unfortunately, I do not express myself very well in natural language because I am a programmer, so <laughs> I need help. I don't, I, don't think, I don't agree with that. You speak really well, but okay. <laughs> this is Gemini. So Gemini is kind of like ChatGPT. Yep. It's like Google's version, right? Yep. Now, one of the really cool features of Gemini is these ideas of gems. Now, gems allow you to include like your own resources in its knowledge bank. Okay. So I've got this one here. This is called APIs, IoT, and Hardware Security. And it is a specialist cybersecurity expert in API and, and IoT security. It provides comprehensive and accurate information. I love that. Um, but I've included a bunch of books here. So yeah. I've got from day zero to zero day, practical IoT hacking, hardware hacking handbook, hacking APIs. I got a ton of books in here that I've put in. So you can train it. So I can train it on like specific um, like stuff I want to do, right? Yeah. And so when I use my gem, I show you one that I did earlier. So this is a weather station project I was working on. Yep. And you can see I've asked like, how can I secure my RF weather station? And you can, and it's pulled out information from practical IoT hacking and the hardware hacking handbook. It tells me what chapters and what pages to look at. And you can actually like see exactly where in the book it like is getting that information from. Yep. And so I've kind of created a few of these that are like a lot of the backbone between by me figuring out how to vibe code something and what I actually need to do. Um, but the best thing you can do is have Gemini just on its own produce a sprint plan. So obviously when we're uh, developing, we don't just say, I'm going to make a massive application. Yeah. We break it down into features. We turn those features into like a list of requirements. Yep. And then we take those requirements and that's what we build up. We basically engineer a to-do list. Yep. Uh, and that's called a sprint plan. So I'm going to ask uh, Gemini here, I'm going to say, I would like a sprint plan for a basic port scanning application. Now we've just told it something naughty. Yes. It doesn't like exactly. create hacking tools. I am a security researcher. <laughs> Which you are. Trying to, trying to uh, secure my network. So we've got to make sure it knows we have good intentions. Exactly. I would like it to scan a range of ports, identify the software likely running on those ports, and I should, and I want to specify a IP address. And so then I'm just going to let it create the sprint plan for me. Um, and again, because like, I think this is the hardest part of vibe coding for me anyway, is like actually expressing what I need the AI to do. In my brain, I'm like, okay, I want feature A and feature B yep. and feature C. I'm thinking in the to-do list yep. way, and you kind of have to think backwards. So you can see here, we've got like user stories, and we've got, okay, the core scanning engine. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this, where it says week one core scanning engine. And then I might go into this and like add some more detail. I might turn this into a list of features, um, but I am just going to copy these user stories here. And I'm going to jump into Cursor. So Cursor is my favorite like vibe coding platform. It allows you to jump into the code if you need to. I very rarely do, but sometimes AI gives up. And this is what it looks like. So here we have all the files in our project. In the middle, we have like the stuff that we got Gemini to generate for us. And then on the side, we've got like an actual chat window. Okay. So we can go in here and go, okay, um, let's try this task here. I'm literally just going to copy this. I'm now going to paste it in there. So I'm going to reference these specific lines and say, please create a project in, and I can specify a language. I'm going to specify Python okay. um, because I think I saw it create Python before in Python. And it's easier to edit afterwards, I suppose, if you've got yeah. a bit of Python knowledge. And I'm just going to tell it to make it. And then I do nothing. I sit back. I relax. Yeah. I'm done it's going to go and create it. So you can see here, we've got this like listed one items in current directory. Yeah. Um, so this is it trying to understand what I've got at the moment. I have nothing. Yeah. So now it's actually going to just start creating the file. And this is it programming. Now, if we had like multiple features and multiple files, it would then go into all the different files and kind of understand how it's being used. And we don't have to do any, like, it's just making it. We can just sit here and have a chat. And we just 
Have a break. It's amazing that because you've got PhD in security, you've got years and years of coding. Does that mean someone like me, perhaps, and I'll just use as an analogy, someone who doesn't have a lot of coding could get close to your level of expertise by using something like this, just to create hacking tools. But I, I mean, I'd, I'd be very nervous putting this out into production, like ways other hackers can get hold of it. Yeah, definitely. I think there is a real risk here that, you know, there has been evidence in like malware that people have seen when they've analyzed the malware that shows that the malware authors are actually vibe coding malware, wow. right? Like that is definitely a risk and it is really easy to get AI to generate something that can be harmful. I think for me, my big worry is, you know, AI is allowing malicious actors to scale up campaigns. They don't need to know the technical knowledge. Now they can just vibe code something. And as we kind of move into this new AI dominated lens, there's still always going to be a place for, you know, folks who know who can read the code. AI isn't going to get everything right, but it can get 90% of the way there. And 10% is not that much. And especially for, you know, tools that maybe only you use or like it's just something you use internally. I think it's great. I would never put a vibe coded application up on the internet. I know better than that, thankfully. And as you can see now, we have got our port scanner wow. and we can now run it. So I'm just going to put it in the background. Yeah, I think the concern is right. Companies are starting to use vibe coding. And I saw a video, which I'll link below, where you were talking a bit about this and you were showing examples on X where people were getting hacked because they were just like vibe coding. Yeah. So that's a whole you know, can of worms that. Yeah. But for someone who wants to do pen testing, this is a huge enabler, I, I would assume. Yeah, for sure. I think really what we're seeing vibe coding enable people to do is if you have no like technical experience, like not even no programming, no developer, I'm speaking like you have never ever done, you've never seen like an ethernet cable before, right? I'm talking people who are absolutely nothing. It's really cool because you can see them like be able to express their creativity. I always yeah. compare it to like AI art. AI yeah. art has enabled people who really don't have those technical artistic skills to actually, you know, produce art. It's the same. It's being able to uh, have your kind of like your dreams be made, right? So I think there is a big part of it where, you know, I really want people to be able to do it. I want to yeah. enable safe vibe coding because I think it's so cool. And I love the fact that so many people are developing stuff. And to be honest, you know, we look at places like this and there's tons of products everywhere, yeah. all created by highly technical people yep. for regular folks. And regular folks now can create the stuff they actually need, the stuff that they understand best. And so I think there's a lot of hope there for vibe coding. I think there is still got to figure out how to actually get those guardrails as you're doing it, right? Like, how do you securely vibe code from first prompt, if you like? Yeah, I think there's a lot of technical debt, I suppose, is the right term with this stuff, because if they, if people are making all this code and putting it out there, it's full of vulnerabilities. That's going to be a hacker's paradise. Yeah, it will be. And I, as a hacker, I'm like, I'm so excited for, <laughs> I'm so excited for vibe coded applications. It's going to be good. It's going to be good pickings. Uh, but on the other side, I'm like, man, I, it's going to be so hard. I really feel for folks. And especially if you look at it, you know, these are not people that have ever thought about security. They've put out basically something they've always wanted to make yeah. that they are really passionate about. And then they get a bunch of security researchers yeah. going on Twitter and being like, hey, you left your API keys in, in, in Maine. And for them, it's like, it's a wake-up call. It's a wake-up call, yeah. Yep. So we actually have a successful uh, port scan here. So we've been able to run a port scan on, in this case, my local host. Um, scanned all the ports. None of them are open, which is correct. None of the ports are open on my laptop. And we've done it completely. No code. No code. And it didn't take you very long. I mean, we were talking and stuff in between. That didn't take long at all. No. And, you know, this is a very basic application. When you actually build like a full app with this, there's some back and forth. Yeah. You have to go and like change prompts and like change how you explain it to the AI and work on it. But honestly, it's incredible just to watch something that would have taken, you know, at least a day of like actually programming in seconds. And even if there is an error, I know enough about programming, I could fix it. Yeah. And if you don't, you can actually give the error message to the AI and say, please fix this. The problem is 
that while functional error messages are super obvious, right? They are big, loud, yep. flashing, blah, 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 like error, 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 stack trace. Security vulnerabilities aren't. Yep. They're silent. They lay dormant until they're exposed. And you cannot just tell an AI, do this, but make it secure, or please fix all the security vulnerabilities. It doesn't have that kind of context, but maybe in the future it will. So dumb question, where's the code? Is it up here? So if I wanted to copy that into a, into a, a, a script onto my local, like a Python script, I would just copy the code from here, right? Yeah, absolutely. You, it's got... It's very verbose, isn't it? Yeah. It, does have, it has way more documentation yeah. than I've ever written as a programmer. And it also creates a little uh, readme to explain how to, how to get it to work. One of the other use cases I've also seen is people putting uh, their code into Docker automatically so they don't have to deal with like Docker scripts. And it's just as easy as possible to deploy. So Katie, you someone who's very respected, lots of experience. What's your advice? If someone is into, wants to become a cybersecurity person, wants to become an ethical hacker, this is a great way to start. Is that right? I think so. I think it's a really good way to start to, you know, one, figure out what path you want to go down. I think a lot of folks get really interested in ethical hacking and they realize, because it's kind of cool, right? Like it's, yep. it's kind of, it's a cool job. I get to go around the world and hack people. Isn't that cool? Yep. I think there's a lot more roles than that in cybersecurity. A lot of people start there, but they actually end up their careers somewhere else. So I think it's a really great way to not just like learn cybersecurity and start to like create tools, but also understand, you know, code and how stuff is made. And I think there's good opportunities here. Yeah, for people like me who are doing the hacking side, but also the blue team side to really understand how code is being used, how vulnerability is being introduced creating vulnerable applications themselves to really understand vulnerabilities. There is so much scope here for using it as a learning tool. And, you know, Cursor is free for students as well, so. That's great. And I wanna, I'm not sure if you, if you said it or someone else I heard said it, one of the great advantages of Vibe coding like this is you can't pay for pen testing. You could run this to attack your own infrastructure continuously to make your stuff more secure. Yeah, definitely. There is so many um, like things that hook into like the vibe coding like marketplace uh, that actually are designed for that just to make your stuff more secure. Uh, you can take advantage of it, I think, as well. You know, the best advice I can give to anybody who is considering vibe coding their main product is uh, make sure you've got a security disclosure policy. <laughs> So packers like me can just tell you when something's broken and then you can use our reports to try and fix it. What I'm hearing is use Vibe coding for your own tools, Yeah. but don't put it out on the internet or if you do, you have to be really careful. Yeah, and I think if you work at an organization, you know, people at your organization are gonna start Vibe coding applications yeah. without you knowing about it. Yeah. You know, you can imagine that someone who works in sales might go, oh, I've got a really good idea for a tool that will make me like more efficient in my job. I'm just going to create it, put all the customer data into it. I think that's a real risk as well. Yeah. You know, what? how are employees using this in organizations too? And how do you enable that creativity and, you know, allow people to express themselves? Because it's cool. It's really fun. It's so enjoyable. It's so rewarding, but do it safely and securely. Okay, I've got to ask you, I want, I'm interested in learning. I'm hoping you're putting content on your YouTube channel and other places where people can learn. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. You can go to my YouTube channel, Insider PhD, um, where I've got a full video on making AI generate RESTful APIs for me to, protect, to hack for my YouTube channel. So for everyone who's watching, please go and subscribe. Katie's got amazing content there, hacking APIs, this kind of stuff now. Go sub. Katie, thanks so much. Thank you so much. It's been excellent to be here.